This show is a part of the podcast network of the Walled Garden Philosophical Society, an international community of philosophers and seekers dedicated to the pursuit of truth, wisdom, virtue, and the divine, wherever they may be found. To find out more, go to thewalledgarden.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Searching with Seneca. So today I'm going to be rounding off letter number 18 and we're just going to be reading verses 14 through to the end, which is, well, that's a couple of verses. And uh, and in these verses, Seneca is doing his usual thing. He's giving us a quote from, of course, Epicurus, uh, and he's basically talking about anger and how it is uh, is very much like a momentary madness. And this is a theme that we see all throughout Seneca's letters. And so I want to read this and maybe pick it apart and, and give some practical advice for, uh, you know, how you might deal with anger in your own life, how you might look at it differently. And hopefully I'm able to offer something resembling wisdom on this front. So uh, we'll read this and we'll see what we take away. He says, quote, But now I must begin to fold up my letter. Settle your debts first, you cry. Here's a draft on Epicurus. He will pay down the sum. And he quotes Epicurus, saying, Ungoverned anger begets madness. You cannot help knowing the truth of these words, since you have had not only slaves, but also enemies. But indeed, this emotion blazes out against all sorts of persons. It springs forth from love as much as from hate, and shows itself not less in serious matters than in jest and sport. And it makes no difference how important the provocation may be, but into what kind of soul it penetrates. Similarly with fire, it does not matter how great is the flame, but what it falls upon. For solid timbers have repelled a very great fire. Conversely, dry and easily inflammable stuff nourishes the slightest spark into a conflagration. So it is with anger, my dear Lucilius. The outcome of a mighty anger is madness, and hence anger should be avoided, not merely that we may escape excess, but that we may have a healthy mind. Farewell. End quote. All right, so I love that Seneca, at the end of this letter, you know, chucks in a few absolute gems here for us to think about when it comes to anger. This wasn't the the title of the the letter, it wasn't the subject of the letter, but uh, he decides to go off on a bit of a tangent in the end. And one of the first things that he points out is obviously that quote from Epicurus, where he says uh, that ungoverned anger begets madness. And this is very much in line uh, with the Stoic way of thinking, right? But then Seneca goes on to point out that uh, that anger can be found in all of these different places, right? You know, uh, it can be found in love as much as in hate. He says that it, it's found as, in serious matters as much as in jest and sport, you know. So it's something that really we, we can't escape from in terms of the, the threat of anger and the temptation to allow our minds to go down into those dark places of anger from time to time, right? That that temptation is everywhere to be found. And Seneca goes on to make this really great point, and he says that it makes no difference how important the provocation may be, but into what kind of soul it penetrates, right? And he gives us this analogy of the fire, which I think is is a very useful analogy to think about when it comes to, to anger. And he says that anger is similar to fire because uh, with fire, it doesn't matter how great the flame is, uh, but it's what it falls upon, right? So he says that uh, solid timbers have repelled a very great fire. And conversely, dry and easily inflammable stuff nourishes the slightest spark into a conflagration. And so Seneca is trying to show us here that the wise person or the sage or, you know, the person who we might aspire to be like is going to be more like that solid timber where the spark or the flame that starts to to burn of anger uh, comes along but does not penetrate the tree, right? And so the tree withstands the fire. Uh, whereas if you are kind of the person who is made of that sort of stuff as, as kindling and small sticks and leaves and stuff like that, which are very inflammable, right, uh, then it's 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 going to be easy for you to be penetrated by the temptation of anger that is going to well up within you, right? And so now we have to think about, well, what does it mean to be the kind of person whose soul is is like that easily flammable 
kindling, right? What does it mean to be that kind of person? And we might want to think about the way that the Stoics looked at this, right? Because the Stoics, again, this, this idea that Seneca is giving us here is no different to what I've been saying in multiple episodes previously, this Stoic idea that whatever you need in life to be able to remain in a state of flourishing or a state of calm amid the storms of life, whatever you need for that is going to be found within you, right? It's not going to be found without, it's going to be found within, and it has to come from within. And so the reason why they would think that uh, anger is almost this uh, state of momentary madness, like Epicurus said, is firstly because anger is something that will always cloud your judgment in the moment, right? It's a harsh emotion that pops up and takes over the vessel, right? Uh, And because it's something that is going to cloud your judgment, it is something that will never be helpful in the situation. And so the Stoics were very interested in keeping your mind as clear and clean as possible so that in each moment you can see reality for how it truly is and you can use that information to make the most reasonable decisions of how you should act, right? But anger is something that takes that away from us. You know, it truly is something like a fire that when you feel it burning with inside of you, right, and uh, and, and then you allow it to take over yourself, uh, it, it's almost like it is uh, that kind of moment momentary state of madness where your judgment becomes hindered and you are no longer able to be useful to yourself and others. All right, so let's have a think about an example of a time where you might feel uh, a lot of anger welling up inside of you, burning inside of you, uh, and what the Stoics might say uh, about this situation and what you can do to remain calm and be the most effective person you can be in that moment. Now, let's say, uh, you know, I'm not going to give you the classic example of going in traffic. Let's say you're going to the airport and you're there, you're with your, all your bags, you're about to go on a holiday with your family. And then over the loudspeakers, you hear uh, somebody say, I'm sorry, this flight uh, has now been delayed uh, about three hours. Uh, so sorry for the inconvenience, uh, but this is what's happening. Um, of course, it would be a lot more formal than that. I did a terrible job of that, but that's okay. Uh, Now, let's say uh, on the other end of that flight, there's also a layover that you have, but you don't have enough time now with the delay to get to your next flight in the next place that you need to go to. And so you're starting to watch as all of the flights that you had planned are falling around you uh, and the crumbling away and and your plans are crumbling away and you're about to go on this holiday and you can't believe it, right? So uh, all of these thoughts, all of these feelings are going to be rushing up inside you, right? Now, the Stoics would say, okay, in this moment... There's going to be a whole bunch of stories that are flowing through your mind, and your job is to look at those stories called impressions, right? The impressions that you have about the situation. Uh, Your job is to look at them and then to analyze them and see what would be the most effective, useful, rational response to this situation. And so what are some of the stories or the impressions that might flow through your mind in that moment when you hear that? You know, something like, this is terrible. I can't believe this is happening. This is going to ruin the holiday. This is going to ruin everything. We're going to have to buy new flights on the other end. They're not going to be able to fix it. The company's going to leave us screwed here. You know, there's all these sorts of feelings that might pop up and it might lead you like it does to a lot of people uh, to become very angry and immediately rush to the help desk in order to uh, <laughs> in order to voice your, your anger at the situation situation that this is happening, right? And ironically, the people who take the grunt of people's anger at airports are uh, most often people who have no say in any decision of, of delayed flights or anything like that and cannot do anything about that, right? And so uh, the Stoics would say, listen, you've got all these thoughts running you through your head, right? Firstly, understand that the Stoics would say, that this is not good or bad, this is only an indifferent, right? You don't know whether this delay is going to be good for you or bad for you because you can't tell the future, right? What you can tell is what you're going to do in this moment right now. So remembering that the only good to the Stoics was sound judgment, virtue of the soul, virtue in your character, right? Uh, And the only bad was vice or, you know, unsound judgment. And everything else is to be considered as in motion, undecided, not good or bad, just indifferent. And your only job is to remain in sound judgment. And so you, you take a look at those impressions that are coming up that are making you feel as though you should be that burning fire of, of anger, right? And go and, you know, yell at the first person you can find who, who has a badge. Uh, but 
you need to recognize that there are going to be much better choices that you could make that would actually help the situation and that would actually lead you to having a bit more calm in this situation, being to being able to deal with it in a reasonable way. And so hopefully what will happen is that you will analyze these narratives that are flowing through your mind and the ones that immediately pop up to you when you hear the supposedly bad news, and you will choose to construct a better narrative that allows you to have access to better judgment in this situation. When you have that better judgment, that's when you assent to that better judgment in your actions, right? And you choose to not assent to the immediate uh, kind of more animalistic narratives that flow through your mind uh, that could lead you to assenting to anger and uh, irrational behavior. And at this point, I want to bring in the last thing that Seneca said, because he says that the outcome of mighty anger is madness, and hence anger should be avoided, not merely that we may escape excess, but that we may have a healthy mind. Now, I would not say at all that uh, Seneca is wrong in saying that uh, when we train ourselves out of uh, assenting to anger, uh, you know, it it does lead to a healthy mind. But I would actually suggest that instead of saying that anger is to be avoided, uh, I would actually say that it's more helpful to think about it as anger needs to be understood. And this is something that I discuss with my coaching clients quite often, right? Because to me, it seems like when you're in that really angry state, when the fire is burning, right? It's very difficult to just say, I'm not angry. I don't want to be angry. It's very difficult uh, to avoid uh, uh, being in that state when you're in that state, right? Uh, Or to stop being in that state. Now, what I think is easier is in that state to be able to say, hang on, there's clearly an action that is coming out here, which is is some sort of anger, right? And there's a story that is inside me that is playing out. My job is not to push that away. You know, that's what the, the psychologist would call repression, right? Uh, you don't want to push that feeling down and just pretend like it's not there. What you want to do is understand it. What's the narrative that is playing out in my mind? What does it mean for how I should act, right? And is that narrative true? Do I believe it without questioning it first? You want to understand where the anger is coming from, not just push it away. And I'm not saying that Seneca is saying that because he, you know, he's got this whole kind of philosophy and theology behind him of Stoicism that that teaches us how to deal with this. And a massive part of that is not pushing feelings away, but seeking to understand What are the narratives? What are the stories that you're believing? What are the impressions? To understand what's happening and to understand it critically, right? And so so you're having some distance from the thought to the action, right, which is very important in Stoicism. So anyway, I'll I'll, I'll leave these thoughts with you. I hope you've taken away a few things. I hope there's some wisdom in here, uh, but there's certainly some interesting things to think about in terms of uh, Seneca and Epicurus' thoughts on anger and and how we can better deal with it. But I love that analogy of the fire. I think it's such a beautiful way to think about uh, how these emotions uh, work through us in our lives and and how we might better train ourselves uh, to become like that, that hard oak tree, for example. Example, uh, you know, that can withstand the fires. So, again, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>